<laughs> this is leading edge. <laughs> that is two nanometer. Well, it's two nanometers a name, and it's all about the density. The density, huh? It's leading edge. But this is infrastructure. What's your minimum specification? So what does it mean to be focused on domestic semiconductor sustainability? The current global situation is that with the USA credited with the invention of the transistor and integrated circuit, over 70% of them today are actually made in Asia, from the most advanced process node in your smartphone all the way to space-hardened silicon in the James Webb Telescope, and even that small meter that you installed that has to last 20 years. Most of that silicon still comes from Asia. Global events have pushed the main semiconductor players, both in manufacturing and research, to diversify their portfolios, but also secure the internal supply chains should anything happen. Countries in Asia seem to have continued investment, and in Europe, there's investment in place afoot to subsidize the industry over there. In the US, it's coming in the form of the CHIPS Act, promising up to $52 billion for the semiconductor industry. This is infrastructure. But semiconductors are more than what just comes off the production line, and you have to plan for the development of the next generation technologies, which requires decades of graft and alliances across government, academia, and private businesses. Developing the materials to increase the next generation of performance and price, reliability, as well as the machines to actually do all that takes time as well as funding. And this is where some of the CHIPS Act is likely to end up in the form of a National Semiconductor Technology Center, or an NSTC, bringing together all the research verticals in the United States under one roof to facilitate that domestic semiconductor innovation and provide a supply of resources, facilities, personnel, and to be agile to a new semiconductor challenge. One of the proposed sites for this national center is here at the already expansive Albany Nanotech Center, which already boasts some of the deepest collaboration between federal, academic, and private businesses today. IBM has sponsored us to take you through why Albany is the right site for the next wave of domestic semiconductor innovation. So look, I know what you're thinking here. IBM, that old company, what have they done for semiconductor development? Well, it turns out the answer is quite a lot. You remember last year we spoke about IBM being the first to a two nanometer production chip? Well, there's that, but there's plenty more we'll see on this fab tour today. IBM, or more affectionately called the Big Blue, is the vast company covering computing research, hardware, and software. They've been at it almost as long as anyone else, and over the last 40 years, a big focus on that has been materials and manufacturing research into semiconductors. This research is often licensed to the foundry players or the machine manufacturers, who also partner with IBM to realize their joint goals. Big names involved with IBM include Intel, a foundry player making the chips, as well as tool manufacturers such as Applied Materials and Tokyo Electron. In collaboration with the State University of New York, literally right next door here to Albany Nanotech Center, the collaboration also crosses into academia, with professors able to form research as well as train the next generation of engineers. Recently, IBM has done more than simply headline-grabbing details. Two nanometer was a milestone, as IBM was also developing seven nanometer and the first five nanometer gate all around chips. But perhaps more importantly, this is where gate all around transistors were realized in a way that they could scale. Now, gate all around transistors, as you probably know, represents the next decade of transistor technology from all the major players. Now, IBM is already working here on what's next and the finer details of how to do that production. I met up with Dr. Maresh Kure, IBM's VP of Hybrid Cloud, whose remit covers IBM Semiconductor Research, to understand what makes this Albany facility a hub of innovation. I, th I think it's important to get everybody to understand what research is done here at Albany, especially you know, from IBM's perspective. Well, thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. And so let me, <laughs> let me share with you first that uh, Albany Nanotech is uh, one of the most advanced 300 millimeter research facility, which is a public-private partnership in North America. It's the most advanced such facility in North America, and we are very proud to be driving strong, uh, you know, semiconductor research roadmap here. We work on both uh, driving uh, leadership technology in logic, uh, as well as in uh, packaging technology, especially focusing on uh, chiplet, which is, uh, you know, which is very exciting and which ex actually extends the uh, logic technology beyond uh, uh, it can reach through scaling. At the end, geared towards uh, getting system level performance, which is uh, at the end what matters to all of us. 
So that's what we do here, and I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation mm. from here onwards. I kind of want, to, want you to talk about this ASIC coalition that IBM and uh, 90 other companies, I think the last official number was, that have formed, especially you know, as it relates to kind of where research is going for, for the US in the future. So can you kind of go through who, who ASIC are and what the plan is for, for ASIC? Right. So ASIC, uh, ASIC stands for American Semiconductor Innovation Coalition. Uh, as you said, this is a very broad coalition of more than 90 uh, participants uh, who are working together. It consists of uh, you know, large private, com private companies uh, as well as uh, many leading universities, many startups, as well as national labs and other consortia as well. So it's a collection of uh, many entities uh, who are coming together towards the you know, common goal to drive, uh, you know, to, to figure out how, what should be the right agenda for uh, a semiconductor leadership in the U.S. to develop tools uh, for both for, uh, you know, for the industry as well as for our uh, legislature who are putting this uh, uh, proposal together, the CHIPS Act together, so that, uh, you know, we can have a, a good understanding of uh, how we can jumpstart uh, you know, the, the semiconductor leadership uh, have a secure supply of semiconductor in the, in the, for the U.S. and in the U.S. or Western world, uh, as well as develop a very strong uh, agenda for uh, education and workforce development, which will be equally important uh, towards the success of overall uh, semiconductor industry. So the CHIPS Act, while it has been spoken about for a couple of years now, still has an uphill battle to be passed. It's moving through both chambers of the legislature, and the hope is that it will be passed with bipartisan support. Ultimately, this should be a non-partisan issue, as should the worst happen, the USA does not currently have the infrastructure, full infrastructure needed to support the demands of the semiconductor industry today. Some wonder why, though, companies such as large as Intel or IBM, who make annual profits in the billions of dollars, should get any money if this act passes. There are a part of the audience um, who, who will say, well, OK, IBM is part of this ASIC coalition, and you guys are based here in Albany and, you, and the collaboration that Albany brings. But ultimately, at the end of the day, to a certain extent, it's IBM getting money to enhance um, research and production. Why should IBM get any money at all, given that it's a multi-billion dollar business? That's a great, uh, great question. First of all, uh, let, me, let me be clear that uh, uh, you know, IBM is uh, uh, not in the manufacturing business. Yep. And the grants in CHIPS Act is mainly for manufacturing. Mm -hmm. So the part that IBM is uh, working on is the research and development agenda. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, not about grant in CHIPS Act. That's about creation of this national center. Mm -hmm. So IBM's interest is to be the catalyst to leverage a very strong public-private, uh, or very successful public-private model that uh, already exists uh, in Albany, where IBM, Applied Materials, Tokyo Electron, and many, many more members uh, who are part of this uh, collaboration use that as a template and uh, uh, you know, expand it at the national level. And that's what IBM's interest is. Uh, it will be best for, we believe it will be you know, very helpful for uh, uh, IBM's uh, uh, technology agenda, our clients, as well as for uh, many other uh, companies uh, in, the, in the Western world. So that's where, that's where we are coming from. Uh, in, in this CHIPS uh, and NSTC agenda. To showcase some of the work that IBM and its partners are doing here at this site in Albany, I was given the rare opportunity to see inside some of the labs and fabs on site here, shown around by Michael Monroe, Senior Manager of Business Operations at the Albany Nanotech Center. As was promised to me last year when I spoke to IBM about their latest two nanometer developments, I got to hold a special wafer, wafer probably worth millions of dollars, the most advanced silicon wafer on the planet. It looks a little bit like this. As you probably already know, the tiny chips that go into everything from smartphones to smart watches to cars to rockets to defense or even smart meters, they're all made by printing tiny patterns in silicon, usually 12 to 17 layers high at nanoscale resolutions. This is IBM's latest innovation, where this wave has over 333 million tiny switches per square millimeter or about 213 billion per square inch. They get printed on a silicon wafer 12 inches wide, then get cut up into devices. This way of making chips has been the bedrock of chip production for over 50 years. But getting them this small is the latest research. And while we won't see the results of the research in our devices for another few years yet, the work has been done today. 
Despite the name, two nanometer, it's not actually a physical size, but an indication of the density of these tiny, tiny switches. Now let's see how this wafer tastes. Not too bad, need more salt. On those chips, they rely on the latest advances in material science to get the right characteristics for performance and power. For example, copper is a key material right at the heart of these designs. When you make it this small, it doesn't always behave how it is meant to. Either it breaks, or it doesn't act in a repeatable manner, or something else completely unexpected might happen. This can apply to the 50 other materials used on the chip across 500 manufacturing steps from 120 days start to finish. Some of the work here is also finding better materials that work at nanoscale resolutions. At the nanoscale level, it turns out that copper we've been using for so long is getting so thin that we need to look at other materials. The problem is those other materials can cause issues as they're solving problems. So we have done things like look at combining copper with cobalt and see how those materials interact. Of course, the devil is in the details. How do we combine those materials? Do we layer them like a cake? Do we make them like cookie dough where they kind of merge together? Do we wrap them around each other like a sausage roll? What temperature do we use it at? All of these things are questions that need to be answered. Along with, is what we're doing in the solution going to be manufacturable? Can we do it repeatedly and consistently where it can be produced in a production environment? So this, that one process step happens hundreds of times, and that's what we do in these labs. We have to meticulously look at each process and make sure that the solution is manufacturable and can be done in production. IBM says they can't do this alone, but highlight Albany as a potential semiconductor corridor for the future. A lot of the companies needed to improve the US standing in semiconductors are in the backyard here. We can already pinpoint regional offices from equipment manufacturers, such as Tokyo Electron and Applied Materials, and others, and companies like ASML are just across the border in Wilton, Connecticut. The major software vendors in chip design, a market known as Electronic Design Automation, or EDA, are also local. This area of New York State already plays host to Global Foundries, a chip manufacturer focused on specialty technologies, 5G automotive and embedded applications, and other foundries have presented this Northeast Corridor as a potential for future manufacturing excellence. But there was one last thing that IBM wanted to show me. So you're looking at our most recently renovated fab, Nanofab South it's called. In this clean room there's 15,000 square feet of space dedicated to what's going to become an extremely important part of manufacturing called packaging, mm. heterogeneous integration, tip, chiplet technology. It's named several different things. But this fab is dedicated to that. So historically, when we've done packaging and, and chips and computers, they're hooked up to a single power source or mm -hmm. a display. As we, as we use these higher performing chips now, mm -hmm it becomes much more difficult to do that. And we really would like to break them down and companies would like to break them down into smaller chips mm. that can be packaged together. Now, that's easy to say, hard to do. What we are looking at now is stacking chips together on top of one another called 3D integration. Now, that can be problematic in that it could make all the chips slow down if it's not done properly. They could get too hot, not perform as well. Mm. So what we're doing here in Nanofab South is performing experiments to try to make sure we're doing that reliably and at scale. So they're not wrong here. We are seeing new chips on the market now already using advanced packaging and 3D stacking. However, it is not a solved problem. Different markets require different solutions at different price points as well. So being able to stack silicon together reliably is actually quite difficult. If joining two bits of silicon together has a 99% success rate, then if you have a chip with 47 chiplets, the overall success rate is only 63%. That's actually an issue for Intel's next generation processor for machine learning, because that is using 47 chips with advanced packaging. So while the focus for the last 50 years has been on Moore's law, these organizations and alliances are having to go above and beyond, researching more than more technologies to provide packaging solutions for the next 50 years. So putting me in a research fab is like having a kid in a candy shop. I will touch everything and I'll ask plenty of annoying questions, such as why, how, when. 
I'm pretty sure that I could stay a week here and I can make a dozen hour long videos about my favorite elements of research that go on behind these walls. What surprised me most coming into the facility is the level of integration. I knew that New York State is the landlord, State University is literally next door, and the facility is an amalgamation of private management with IBM and others, academic and state partnerships, but it wasn't until I came here that I realized how the three work together. Now, of course, you're probably thinking it's a bit odd for a Brit like me to be talking to you about the US investment in its own domestic semiconductor infrastructure. We've got our own specialisms in Europe to focus on. Companies that have standing in the semi space, such as ASML, IMEC, CAA Leti, Soitec and others. And the UK has plenty of enough issues that I don't expect to see any semiconductor investment there beyond startups anytime soon. But the UK isn't the hub of semiconductor excellence that the US has been over the decades. Most of the companies I deal with day in, day out, are either US based or have a strong US presence. And so there's a compelling narrative to keep that supply chain from research to development and production closer together to expedite its utility, but also keep it insulated from external factors. The National Semiconductor Technology Center is one of the key factors in the CHIPS Act. It will become a reality when the bill is passed and the US can be more competitive against other semiconductor competition. But the question is really about whether that center, or at least a hub of that center, should be located, who is involved, and what it provides for the people local to it. Between New York State, the university here at Albany, the ASIC Alliance and IBM, there's a compelling story that the center should be here.